good. Nice to see everyone that's managed out this evening. Thanks for coming along. Um, we're continuing in the book of Philippians, and uh, we're towards the end there of chapter number one. So if you have your Bibles, perhaps we can open them together in Philippians and chapter number one. Philippians chapter number 1, and let's read uh, from verse number 21. Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 21. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I wot not. For I am in a strait betwixt two having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. Only let your conversation or your way of life be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. Let's just bow our heads, shall we, and ask for God's help. Let's pray together. Our Father, we do come into thy presence this evening and we thank thee our Father for the living word of God and we thank thee our Father that once again the words that we read that they're very very pertinent they're very relevant to the day and the time that we live and we ask your Father that in grace that thou would help us as we would uh, just uh, meditate upon these things and we do pray Father that uh, thou would speak to our hearts and bring us our Father the things of the Lord Jesus uh, we pray, Father, uh, that Thou would strengthen us and give us help to live uh, for Thee. And we ask our Father that uh, in the circumstances that we pass through, that we might see the hand of our God. We pray, our Father, that even in these difficult times, there may be those that would come and find the Lord Jesus Christ. And we do just bless, uh, ask for Thy blessing on each one. Speak to us tonight, our Father, in that personal, individual way, which the Holy Spirit alone speaks to us in. And we ask our Father that thou would give us help as we pray, Father, for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this little uh, last part of the uh, first chapter of the book of Philippians, there's a word in it I'd like just to highlight uh, to you. And much of our thoughts is going to be focused upon that little word. It's a very important word in the book of Philippians. If I can just uh, turn your eyes down to verse number 25, you'll notice a la that, that little word joy for your furtherance and joy of faith. And again, you've got a very similar word there in verse 26, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ. And uh, Philippians is full of this little word, joy. Uh, about 18 times in this little letter, you'll find joy or rejoicing. Uh, and I suppose in a sense, that's a quite a strange thing, because as you remember, it's written by the Apostle Paul in prison, in difficult circumstances. And yet it is absolutely full of joy and his rejoicing in the Lord Jesus Christ. And in fact, in this little section here, joy is very much the secret of everything that happens. The Apostle Paul has a great purpose that he sees in his life and it's focused upon joy. He, he, he looks for proof of the uh, Christians at Philippi. He looks for proof of their 
of the reality of their faith and he sees that in their joy. Uh, and he looks too for power to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and the, the power to live for the Lord Jesus Christ comes not just by obeying the truth of the Bible, as good as that is, uh, and not simply in, in adhering to a set of rules or principles, but the real power to live for the Lord Jesus Christ comes from enjoying and a joy in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this little section, as the whole letter, uh, is full of joy. The other word, uh, the other idea that I think you'll find in this little section as well, which is very, very relevant for the day that we live in. You'll find it in verse 28, verse 28, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries. And I'd like to suggest to you that we have one of the great secrets of fearlessness in Philippians chapter number one. Uh, we have, you see, this infectious fear that runs through Philippians chapter number one. Do you remember how Philippians one began? It began with Christians afraid to preach the gospel, and yet that fear is overcome. And so we've got the secret of fearlessness in Philippians chapter one, and the secret of fearlessness is joy. It's joy that overcomes fear. Let me take you to two little verses in the word of God, uh, if I can just... Uh, perhaps illustrate this point. The first is an interesting one. It's back at the beginning of Luke. Luke chapter 2 and verse number 10. We're right at the beginning of the story of Jesus Christ. And right at the beginning of the story, the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, you find two great words that in a sense are contradictory. You can't have them together. You have to choose one or the other. Philipp uh, Luke chapter 2 Verse number 10 says, And the angel said to them, that's the shepherds, The angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. You've got a choice, shepherds. You can choose one or the other. It's either fear or joy. They're not compatible. You can't have them together. It, it's... Uh, I think probably something that I have never seen in, the, uh, in my, my 20 years of practicing to see someone who is anxious and afraid and full of joy. I've never seen it. Never once have I ever seen it. You choose one or the other. Anxiety, fear or joy. You can't have them both. In fact, it is one of the reasons that people sometimes will come and seek help. Because all the joy in their life has gone because it's been crushed by fear and anxiety. There's another little verse back in the book of Joel that illustrates something very similar. Joel chapter 2 verse 21 which says, Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. In other words, you've got a choice. Just using it as a, just, to, just to illustrate the point. You've got a choice. You either fear or you rejoice. But you can't do both, one or the other. And in Philippians chapter number 1, we've got this solution in the sense, or this uh, great antidote to fear, the, the secret of fearlessness. Why was it that the Apostle Paul seemed to be so oblivious to his fate? Why was it that he wasn't trembling and afraid at the prospect of trial and death? Why was it he saw so much positive in, in the experience he was passing through? It was because he was truly rejoicing in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it was that joy in the Lord Jesus that uh, infused him. There, there was a man uh, many years or a few years ago uh, called Alexander Solvenitska. And uh, he wrote a book. Uh, he wrote a number of books, in fact. Uh, one of them was called the Gulag Ar Ar Archipelago. Now, if those names sound strange, it's because he was Russian. But he was placed in a concentration camp in Russia just after uh, the Second World War. And he wrote many stories about the experiences of Christians uh, in, in, those, in those settings. One of the stories that he told was about an elderly Christian lady. And she was brought in before the KGB for interrogation. And uh, the KGB, uh, if you've read a little bit of history, you'll know uh, what kind of people they were. Um, torturers and murderers, butchers, cruel, the cruelest kind of, of folks. And they were interested in, in getting information out of this little lady. They wanted the identity and they wanted the place where the, one of the Christian leaders in Russia was. And they knew that she knew. Her reply was very interesting. She said, there is nothing that you can do to me. She said, you see, you are afraid of your superiors. You are afraid of death. And you are even afraid of killing me. 
but I have Jesus Christ and I am afraid of nothing. There is nothing that you can do to me. Well, that is very much, I think you could almost put that in Philippians chapter number one, couldn't you, of the experience of the Apostle Paul? There was nothing that they could do to him to silence him, nothing that they could do to him to make him change his mind because he had the joy of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's just look at this little section uh, briefly together. The secret of fearlessness, the experience of joy. Well, you notice in verse number 21 that the Apostle Paul uh, has that, we have that great uh, verse that really would sum up the life of the Apostle Paul. He gives it as a summary of his life. Verse 21, for me, or for to me is to live is Christ, to die is gain. And we saw that the Apostle Paul could look at his uh, past experience. He could look back and he could say, well, you know, because I've been led by the Lord Jesus into this experience, because I've been led and guided by his spirit into the position that I'm in, I can have confidence that it is for the good. Do you remember Psalm 23, that he leads us in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake? So if we are led by him, if we're led by his spirit, it will be for his glory. It will be for our good. It will be for the blessing of others. And so the Apostle Paul has been led, confidently led, all the way from the road to Damascus, all the way from his conversion at Acts 9. He's been obedient to the Spirit of God. He's now in a place of uh, imprisonment and uh, all of the prospects that that brings, but he's confident that it must be for the glory of God. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. I've followed him, and if I follow him, ultimately it must be for the good and for the blessing. There's a little hymn in our hymn book. Uh, hymn number 70 it is in the Believer's Hymn Book. And uh, it kind of captures that idea. I think the hymn writer had it very much in mind as he was writing that hymn. Hymn 70 in the Believer's Hymn Book. It says, He leadeth me... O blessed thought, O words with heavenly comfort fraught. Whate'er I do, where'er I be, still tis God's hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me. By his own hand he leadeth me. In other words, says the hymn writer, it doesn't matter so much the details of the experiences that I'm in, providing I know his guiding. There's comfort in it. There's a blessing in it. There must be. If he led me into it, it must be for his glory. It must be for my good. It must be for others' blessings. That's what the psalmist found in Psalm 23, following his shepherd, uh, he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. There's an interesting thing about that verse as well in that hymn. I don't know if you've ever noticed it. It's maybe a, just a change of language today. But that uh, seven, hymn number 17, the believer said, He leadeth me, O blessed thought, O words with heavenly comfort fraught. Words with heavenly comfort fraught. That word fraught, it sometimes means difficulty. It sometimes means uh, uh, a challenge, a problem, something a bit fearful. In other words, maybe even in the fearful and difficult circumstances of our Christian life, as long as he leads me, there's comfort in it. <laughs> I think maybe there's a double meaning in that. Anyway, Philippians chapter number two, the apostle confident he's been led. And so he looks at his life and he sees that there is blessing. We noticed that previously. Do you remember that there was blessing for the sinner? Uh, the Verse 12, the things that have happened to me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. People have got saved and heard the gospel because he's been put in prison. Maybe not the best platform you might choose, but it's the one that the Lord Jesus chose for the Apostle Paul, and therefore he blessed. There was blessing for the sinner, there was blessing for the saints. Verse 14, many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident, my, my bonds are much more bold to speak the word without fear. They were emboldened and encouraged and challenged to preach the gospel. And of course, there was blessing for the Apostle Paul, as we saw uh, there down about verse number 20. According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be made great in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Uh, that light that shone out of the life of the Apostle Paul, when it was magnified through the lens of the Lord Jesus Christ, it came like a laser light, pushing out of the life of the Apostle Paul. It came with renewed focus and renewed power in bringing the gospel to those around 
him. And so there was blessing, there was blessing, there was blessing in the experiences through which he found himself. Uh, it was the Lord, you see, that did indeed place Esther there in the king's palace. Not, not a nice place to be for a young woman, but it was she was there in the will of God and she saved many. It, it was the mind in the will of God to permit Daniel to be placed in the lion's den and that ultimately too ended in blessing. It was the mind in the heart of God to lead David into the valley of Elah and he faced Goliath in that valley. That was a terrifying thing, but ultimately it was a victory for the glory of God and the blessing too of David. It ultimately led to his enthronement and kingship. Well, the apostle not only looks at the present, but he also looks at the future. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. And as he looks to the future, um, he, he has ambitions for the future. Um, there was a medicine many years ago uh, that used to, advertise its, its, its ability to, to save lives. It was a medicine for high blood pressure and the sales reps used to come round with this big advert and it had a man on it, an older man, and he was taking the medicine. And I always remember the, the strap line that was on the advert, heaven can wait, heaven can wait. So successful was this medicine that he was just going to, well, he's going to live a bit longer, you see. Heaven can wait. Well, there's a sense in which you could write that above here. Heaven can wait. The Apostle Paul is keen to get into the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, but he also, he also is happy to delay that. Not for a bad reason, not because of lack of faith or anything like that, but he has a purpose in, in, in his Christian life. It's a purpose that is a, a fascinating purpose, I think, in verse number 25, as he looks at the kind of ministry that he has uh, amongst the Christians. And he says this, verse 25, And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith. Paul sees his purpose in staying here a little longer, first of all, that he might see progress in their life, and secondly, that he might bring joy, that he might bring joy in his ministry. What a tremendous summary of the ministry of the Apostle Paul. Heaven, in a sense, can wait for the Apostle Paul for that reason. Not that he's afraid, uh, not that he is lacking in faith. Uh, he isn't one of those kind of Christians that, well, a, a GP colleague of mine once summarized the Christians in his town as being people that go to church on a Sunday and sing about heaven and then fill his waiting room on a Monday trying to avoid going there. <laughs> and maybe a lack of faith. Uh, well, that's not, that's not why he's got, uh, why, why there's a delay here in, in Philippians chapter number one. But he's got real purpose. And it all has to do with that little word joy. There is purpose in his joy. He wants that overflowing joy in the Lord Jesus to be infectious and to inspire. And so if you and I went to hear the preaching of the Apostle Paul, well, you, you would certainly hear the gospel. You would certainly hear about conversion. He was clear in his conversion. You would hear about sin. You would hear about the power of Jesus Christ to change lives. The fact that the Apostle Paul stood in front of you proved that. There was a murderer. There was a man who hated Christ and who persecuted the church. And now he was being used to preach the Lord Jesus Christ. You'd hear about the power of conversion. You'd hear about the power of changed lives. You'd hear about the reality of sin and the suffering and the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. His preaching was filled with the cross. But he, his ministry was also filled with this, the joy of the Lord Jesus. He never invited Emdi to come in faith to the Lord Jesus and go away miserable. As if, uh, as if the Christian life was a right dreary drag. But rather he, he was preaching the joy of knowing the Lord Jesus. So verse 25. I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith. That your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. I want you to rejoice in Jesus Christ. Philippians is full of this. It is full of rejoicing in the Lord Jesus. Now, what does that actually mean to rejoice in the Lord Jesus? Well, it means a number of things. I think, first of all, it means to rejoice in him personally. Really to rejoice in the Lord Jesus Christ personally. So, if you were to go over, let me just illustrate this, if you were to go over to Philippians chapter number 3. Let's maybe turn over there with me, would you? Philippians chapter number 3 and verse number 1. 
which says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to, to you, uh, uh, to me indeed is not grievous, but for you it is saved. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in his person. And for those of us who know the Lord Jesus Christ, it is something tremendously encouraging to find the Lord Jesus Christ in the scriptures, for example, to, to rejoice in the fact that faith is founded on a solid rock, to flick through the pages of your Bible and to see him there in the Old Testament, to see him in the prophecies and uh, to see him there being expected for thousands of years, to see the details of his life written by the prophets, to see his cross, not only in the Gospels, but to see it in the writings of David a thousand years beforehand. To see his sufferings, again, not only in the Gospels, but to see his sufferings in the book of Isaiah. Uh, to see uh, the, the, the uh, way in which he moves amongst men and women in the Gospels, the way that he touches uh, the, the sick, the way that he satisfies, that he fills the hungry. Are you hungry? Are you thirsty? He's able to satisfy that thirst. He's able to bring joy to that life. So we, we rejoice, first of all, in his person. Secondly, you can rejoice in his presence. Let me just flick over to Philippians 4, verse number 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Verse 6. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. And, and the way that we rejoice here is found in verse 5. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. He's near. He's near. We rejoice in his person, but we rejoice in his presence. He's really near. Even at times when we don't know how we can manage or we don't know what we can say and we don't know which way to turn, his presence can be real and almost beyond description that we know his guidance. We, we know what to say and, and, and we know his peace, he speaks about his peace that goes beyond all understanding. A peace that is real when he draws near. And here, of course, in Philippians 4, when he protects our hearts and our minds. We rejoice in his person, his presence. I remember a number of years ago, a, um, a friend coming along to meetings here. And he, he came for a number of months. And uh, I, I, I asked him um, a question that, I said to him, it's been good to see you coming along. And, uh, I said, can, can you tell me what it is you get out of these meetings? Um, he said, I, I don't know. He says, I, I'll think about it and get back to you. The next week he came along again and he said, you know, I've been thinking about your question. What is it that I get out of these meetings? He said, peace. There's a peace. That's interesting. I wasn't expecting that answer, actually. But oh, that's a really good answer. It's a really good biblical answer. Because we have it at the end, for example, of John's Gospel. We've got it here as well in Philippians chapter number 4. The Lord Jesus Christ promises a peace where he is present. And we often speak about meetings, maybe sometimes just small meetings like we have tonight. Good to see everyone that's here. But, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ promises that where two or three are gathered together, there am I in the midst of them. And he also promises at the end of John's Gospel that his peace he gives to us. And in fact, you'll find the tr disciples afraid in, in the upper room after the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. They, they, uh, they've, got the, they've got the burglar alarm on and all the doors locked and everything, you know, and, and they're afraid of the Jews. But with the Saviour drawing near, my peace I give unto you. The presence of the Lord Jesus Christ is a presence of peace. That's tremendous. Uh, we rejoice in the person. We rejoice in his presence, often his peace. We rejoice in his provision as well. You've got that in chapter number four, uh, verse number three, the provision of salvation. Here's something to rejoice in. If you've come to faith in the Lord Jesus, you put your faith and trust in him, you've committed your life to him. Well, rejoice in that. Philippians 4, 3, my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. There's something to rejoice in. Your salvation. His provision, the fact that he saved you. And maybe like the Apostle Paul, there are all sorts of uncertainties between today and tomorrow. You might not even know if you're going to be alive tomorrow. That was the case here with the Apostle Paul. But one thing he could rejoice in, that irrespective of what Caesar did to him, what the Romans did to him, or even what the Jews did to him, 
Christ had done something for him. He'd written his name in the book of life. And that wasn't going to go away. Heaven was certain. Heaven was sure. Maybe heaven could wait in Philippians chapter number one. But heaven was absolutely certain in Philippians chapter number four. So we rejoice in his person, his presence, his provision of salvation. Rejoice in his peace. You've got that in verse seven. We mentioned that the peace of God that passes all understanding. You could rejoice in his preservation, the way he keeps us, sustains us. Philippians 4, 7. The peace of God which surpasses understandings shall keep, it will preserve your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. A friend of mine was just sharing recently with me that kind of an experience they had gone through in sickness and in difficulty and they felt the preserving power of the Lord Jesus and raising them up to health and strength. Uh, that's real in our experience. We rejoice in his preserving grace. We, re we, we rejoice in prayer as well. We've got in these verses and we rejoice as well in his providence. Philippians 4.10 But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again wherein ye were also careful. That was a, a point for rejoicing in the Apostle Paul's life. There was something in his life he needed. He was in prison. He needed food. He needed clothing. And miraculously it appeared. Well, maybe not quite miraculously. People had deliberately sent it to him. But nonetheless, it came at a really timely moment. It came just when he needed it. And he could see the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ in that. Just those strange circumstances that come together, but under the all-powerful guiding hand of God, just like the stab of a finger. Absolutely. I've shared experiences like that in the past. I don't want to go off too much like a tangent, but I do remember a number of years ago, um, it was a, yeah, I remember as a student uh, being a bit broke and um, uh, I had a, an old uh, Vauxhall Chevette car, I remember, and uh, they used to call it a Vauxhall Shove-It. Maybe some of you remember the Vauxhall Shove-Its, um, and it was. And I remember uh, it being in the garage, uh, and uh, just as I was leaving the garage, a uh, guy came up and he said, he said, listen, he said, somebody's left something here from uh, last year. He said, you can have it if you want it. He says, it's an, it's a, it's an exhaust for a Vauxhall Chevette. He said, it just fits your motor. He says, you don't need it. He says, but you can have it. Oh, thanks very much. They put it in the back. I think about five miles down the road, the uh, the exhaust fell off, and they had one in the boot. You know, it was it was a particularly timely provision, just what I needed, even just before I needed it. Well, the apostle Paul knew that, but in a far bigger way in Philippians, and he rejoices at the hand of God in his experience. Well, joy, Philippians one, joy, joy, the purpose of his Christian ministry to bring joy. Verse twenty five. We're back in Philippians one. Uh, and having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith. Joy is a proof of the Christian experience. Verse 28. And in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. That joy that was the possession of the Christian was not compatible with fear. Remember we saw that in Luke you can be afraid or you can rejoice. It's there in Joel chapter 2. You can have fear or you can have joy. These Christians did not fear. Why? Because they'd, they had the, the, the joy of the Lord Jesus. It was that joy that overcame the fear. And, and they faced their enemies. And nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition. Again, I suppose if you're familiar with the history books, you'll know that there are many that would face the adversary. Uh, you look at the stories of the Second World War, the First World War, there are many men that would face their adversaries. But from what I can read and what I can see, they face their adversaries because of fear. They don't want to die. They're afraid to die. They want to preserve their own life, maybe their own land. And through fear, they face the adversary. But the Christian here in verse 28 is different. He's overcome fear <laughs> and he faces the adversary. He's not afraid to die. He's not afraid of what might happen. He faces the adversary through the joy of the Lord Jesus. The purpose of joy, the proof of joy, and the power of joy. Verse 29, for unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict for you, which you saw in me and now here to be in me. Hymn 116, the believers, the first verse says this, My rest is in heaven, 
my rest is not here. Then why should I murmur where trials are near? Be hushed, my sad spirit, the worst that can come, but shortens the journey and hastens me home. You see, for the Apostle Paul, it was a win-win situation. <laughs> Heads he win and tails they lose. It doesn't matter, you see, whether he served the Lord Jesus Christ in life, the Lord Jesus would be glorified, his people would be blessed. Or death, the Lord Jesus would be eternally glorified. Irrespective of which way it turned, there would indeed be blessing. It is given uh, through that power of that all-consuming joy uh, to suffer for his name's sake. Let's pray together, shall we? Our Father, we do give thanks for this joy that fills and filled the Apostle Paul. We thank thee, our Father, for a joy that he shares with a passion uh, with us and with other believers. And we thank thee, our Father, that herein is the secret of his Christian life, not adhering to a set of rules or regulations, not just going through things mechanically because he's been told to do so, but we thank thee, our Father, that his uh, courage and confidence comes from that rejoicing in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we do give thanks, our Father, that we have so much to rejoice in. We thank thee, our Father, that we have the person of the Lord Jesus Christ to rejoice in right the way through the Scriptures, his presence with us at this uh, uh, moment. We thank thee, our Father, for that presence that we've enjoyed, the provision in that eternal salvation. We thank thee, our Father, too, for that practicable uh, a provision that we enjoy day by day uh, too for his peace and for the prayer and for his preserving grace. We thank the Earth Father that we rejoice in him and we thank the Earth Father that that rejoicing indeed is a joy that overcomes the fear of this world and the fear, our Father, of opposition. We know that we have in Christ a great Saviour and one, our Father, who is able to sustain and inspire us. We thank the for the word of God, we pray that they would bless it. We thank thee for friends that have come along tonight. We pray that they would encourage each of us. And we thank thee, our Father, too, for friends that join us too uh, online. And we do pray that they would bless as they would listen uh, to the word of God. We pray that it might be an encouragement and that it might indeed bring joy as we would indeed just uh, uh, think and uh, rejoice in the person and the power and the work of the Lord Jesus. We offer thanks, our Father, praying for thy blessing in Jesus' name.